Thank you, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. So um, I asked our panelists to begin with a very short uh, introduction of themselves. Uh, if everyone would just um, be willing to share their name, their roles at Hamlin, their pronouns, and um, and then we'll, we'll dive into questions. And I will um, ask, uh, I'll start us off, and then if you will just pass to the next person. So um, Professor Laura Doherty, would you introduce yourself? My name is Laura Doherty, and I'm a professor in the Department of Theater and Dance. I work on the theater side of that ampersand. And um, yeah, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm very, very happy to be here today. And I will pass it to Walker. My name is Walker Emser Herbert. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I uh, have been uh, somewhat involved in theater since I arrived at Hamlin um, uh, in a student sense. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here also. And I'll pass it on to Kari. Hi, uh, I'm a, my name is Kari Kimotsu and I go by she, her. And um, I'm a professor in the theater and dance department with Laura. And I'm also the artistic director for the Hamlin Dance Ensemble. Oh, Annika. I'm Annika. I'm a junior here at Hamlin. Uh, I've been a student involved with the theater um, and dance department. I use she, they pronouns, and I'll pass it to Anthony. Hi, everybody. My name's Anthony Mang. I use he or they pronouns, and I'm a dance ensemble member. It's my first year, actually, on the dance ensemble, and I'm also very grateful to be on this webinar. Anthony, I feel very sad that you didn't share what your major is. I'm a public health and legal studies major as well. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, now that we've all introduced ourselves, uh, I want to start us off with a question um, that is for anyone. So if you feel so moved, please uh, jump right in. But what does being a part of a performance arts community mean to you? Um, and why did you want to be a part of the um, performances this semester in particular? Um, so I have done performance for um, like about half my life now, and it's always been a space of collaboration um, and identity, like finding and sharing and building that community identity. Um, and I think right now for me in my life, like after um, these two years of like COVID and especially hard times for performance and then just for the world, it was very important to me to continue to find a space of collaboration, whether it be in the dance with Kari or with um, the show with Laura. Um, and it was that creativity of storytelling um, and finding like a voice um, within the stories was important now that we're also moving into spaces where we can be back in person and be live and share that spiritually with each other. So I think that was part of my um, value of this semester's work. I mean, kind of echoing what Annika said of like, you know, the space of collaboration in theater is always quite, um, you know, present or when it's effective, when it's good. Um, typically, there's a key point of, you know, cohesion around like a shared goal of what you want a final product, a final piece to look like. And uh, when you have a show that the cat you're not only acting in but you're also helping to write you're also helping to you know stage directions you know all this stuff of, or like um blocking you know it's all very um it just adds to the collaboration and you know with the homing project there was a clear emphasis on collaboration not only because we were all going to write the show together but it was like, if we don't, then it will not happen. And so there was like a, everyone coming together to make this thing because we care about making it. That is just very, uh, you know, that's in a time when it's so hard to be around people. Um, something like a project like that is very, very um, helpful and very cathartic perhaps. Um, yeah, I also want to echo Walker and Annika on this sentiment of collaboration, but also this sense that I have another sentiment of like, almost like creativity that is like magical. Every time I'm in a space, in especially for dance, 
it's like I can't explain it but it's like this like focus and drive and passion for like creating something right and creating something as a team as members that love to create movement right and it just comes from a place that like I don't know why the word magical is coming up in my head but it is it it's really cool to see what what um ideas and like forms of movement is like created just based on like an idea of like oh um that like leaf blowing in the wind is really cool like I wanted to try to emulate that it's like really cool to see so yeah is it fair to say for both Walker and Anthony that performance is something that you came to in college that Annika referenced sort of that this has been a part of her life for a long time is it newer for both of you I for me like uh I think being an only child, you're always kind of like center stage of your own play, aren't you? Um, so I think in front of an audience other than my parents, absolutely, Hamlin was the first true case of performance. But I do think that want for the attention, the spotlight certainly was there from the get-go. I just want to highlight one of the things that I think is really um, gratifying and exciting about a place like Hamlin is the ability to come to performance and find performance if it hasn't been something you've done forever and forever and that you had to audition to get, you know, to be part of. Um, certainly from the perspective of being a faculty member in the arts and in the in the Department of Theater and Dance, what well, I know, I hope, and I'm, I don't want to speak for Kari, but I feel like I'm, um, it hopefully will resonate with her is the ways that performance and performance creation are epistemologies, are ways of knowing. And so what we are all after on campus is how figuring out how we think and thinking of majors and programs and disciplines as lenses through which we learn and conversations through which we understand the world and ask hard questions and honoring that embodied knowing that knowing and figuring out and asking and critiquing with your body in both dance and through movement and theater is um, not just as valid, but as needed a, a way of knowing and a way of exploring on, um, and a center for learning and thinking that, that, it is, that is a university. And so how we want stuff, you know, have themes that tie in, whether it's what we'll talk about tying into the CJL, but just thinking about that it's a, that, that it is an intellectual um, and scholarly endeavor as well in a different way. So I wanted to piggyback on what Laura was saying. I think one of the things that I've been investigating, um, especially this last year, but even during COVID is what is community and how do we redefine that? I think, um, during, I think with two, a, almost a two year hiatus where we are, because of the pandemic, we've had to redefine who we are as a community, like a, who is in our community, right? So there are these like, you know, we're told we should be only maintaining space within our in group, right? Our five friends or our, what are, you know, for safety reasons. And so one of the things that the challenges I see in creating work as we're moving and emerging out, hopefully out of the pandemic, is that the, the, there's a redefinition of how we define what is community. And, um, you know, and I always liken back to you know, some brewer self identity and social identity, and there's an in group and then there's an out group. And what we're trying to do is to figure out how an artistic process can bridge that. Because I feel like in many respects, we have become really insular to um, our own community. And so I've been thinking a lot as a maker, but also as a facilitator and a mover and as an educator, how do I use an art form that hopefully can broaden the sense of community? So, because I feel like we've shrunk in many respects um, in the last couple of years. And so that's been a really important, sorry. Um, that's been a really important um, 
thing. And maybe we t- we're talking about it a little bit later, but I, that's something that I've been really trying to redefine as an educator. This really, I think, is a beautiful um, segue into my next question. And I do love how the dog is a part of the community. And that felt very affirming that your dog was sort of <laughs> punctuating your, your point there. Um, so my next question for anyone, for all of you, is how has your involvement with theater and dance, performance, and art contributed to your own healing and creating of community? And I think that's sort of the piece I'm sort of seeing tie into Kari's point about sort of what what is community um, and how are we defining it now, but how for you personally has it been a space of healing um, and creating community? Um, I think I'll I'll take this one. Um, So being the son of two Khmer immigrants who survived a genocidal regime, there's a clear and direct line of like generational trauma, right? And I told Kari this like earlier in the year that like I wanted to like create a movement, probably not this year, but maybe next year on something that like acknowledges that because like for me, I I was born here, I was raised here, grew up in Minnesota my whole life, right? But I still hold this like, I don't know, piece of something that I know, but I don't like, I don't know how to describe that feeling. And um, being a part of dance has really helped me navigate that um, almost like trauma in the sense of like where, what questions do I have about like um, relatives of mine who have been murdered by this genocidal regime? What um, last words were said? What, sacrifices were made or what forms of like um separation that had to be made in order to survive right and so I feel like as a child of Khmer immigrants I have to honor that but I also have to figure out how that is such a huge component of my identity right and my own well-being because um I see it within my parents, right? They deal with it every day, but they don't want to acknowledge it, which is a generational like gap and like difference in thought. However, um, I feel like being able to use dance as almost an outlet, but also as like a tool to honor their stories and their experiences as survivors has been like wonderful. And then in terms of like creating a community, I find that um, it really helps uplift, right? Uplift and support um, basic humanity in my eyes. Like, I, I feel like there, there's a sense of like, we are qu- asking really important questions about experiences that the world has been going through, but also asking what can we do better? What can we do better as people, you know? And so I find that really important and yeah. Thank you, Anthony, for sharing about your family's experience. I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this both um, as professor and student and as friends. And I would just even say, you know, the way in which you bring your whole self into the classroom, I, I, I appreciate hearing that that is something that you also do in, your your performance work um, in dance. So that's I, can I, I just want to piggyback on I know Anthony and I've had a lot of conversations. I think um, like I think about movement and and I, I actually I, I shy away from using just dance because I think dance really is about, there's also this, te- there's a technical element, right? And there is a technical element, but I'm actually thinking broadly when I work with students and with myself in my own body of movement. What is movement? What is movement metaphor? What is, what is embodied practices? What is authentic movement? Right. And so it, 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 um, I, like I'm, I'm, trying to find pedagogy and I'm also trying to find it within my own body, right? Like the decolonization of 
European technique, which is what I have my master's in and what I've been training for 25 years and, and going, I need to decolonize my body to find what it means to move as an Asian American, as a, as a, as, you know, as a, as a, as a racialized Asian body, what does that mean? And so part of that investigation has been incredibly healing. Now that work is really internal. It's not, it's, it's not like it's happening at the theater, but it, but it's work that becomes important because hopefully if I'm doing that work in my own artistic practices and in my own healing practices, then I hope that, that I'm conveying that work and that authenticity to the students who then can do what Anthony's doing and saying, I have my own truth. What is that? What does that mean in movement? How do I, how do I find that inner voice and that creative processing? And so, and maybe that's how we build community. That's how we build empathy toward each other. And in the process, hopefully, develop good work. But I, I actually feel like developing good work is a byproduct. I feel like do the work in the process and then hopefully what comes out of that is um, something of artistic integrity. I don't know if that makes sense, but that is something that I've been um, really um, working on internally myself. So it does make sense. And I love that the two of you were able to sort of talk about um, how that comes together from the instructor side and then the student side and then as performers and director. So thank you. Um, from the rest of the group, does anybody else want to sort of talk about how the work that you've been doing in theater and dance has contributed to your own process of healing or your own process of creating community? I mean, I think that, you know, you can't really be in a process of you know creating a um theater creating movement creating dance you know without having a certain level of created empathy like there's a certain point where you begin to not understand but recognize um patterns in each other that equate um, with whether, you know, movement suggests how someone is feeling or how someone is speaking in the moment suggests, you know, um, what they're thinking, you know, like there's a certain, um, I mean, it comes back to cohesion, doesn't it? Of like, you are all together in this space for, you know, with Homing Project, it was two hours, you know, I've had rehearsals that have been three hours, you know, the, or you are, on a, you're working on a document that, you know, people are signed into for 12 hours. Like it's, um, you all begin to, whether purposefully or not, create connections with each other. And even if it all goes away, the second that the piece is done, that community that was created in that moment is so unique and so special and so important to self-actualized identity, so important to understanding how one feels, um, you know, cause I know like in every piece I've been in, in theater, I've always come away with a, a new idea of how I should um, behave in this world. And um, it's always, I, because of the people around me. And as a straight white man, it is my, it, it needs to be my purpose to learn from people who have different experiences than me and respect them and, you know, make room for them. And you need to do that in a piece. And we, take that into the real world and you end up being a a different person or at least a, a more completed person perhaps walker i really like how at the beginning you were talking about how the process of creativity and the process of um developing a show and participating in it is um, creates empathy and for you as a performer but also i'm minute 
take it a bit farther and sort of think about how that extends then to your audience and your larger community too. But I think you were talking about just personally as, as the, the beginning point. So thank you for that. Um, Monica, did you wanna chime in? A quick note, um, the space of performance and art and everything, um, is a space different and outside of like academic settings, even though in this case it is academic, um, I just find it so beneficial to explore one's story and other stories. Um, as Kari was saying, and as Laura has facilitated space that is creatively and um, openly, where there isn't a right and a wrong and there isn't a gray detached, it's about finding the empathy and finding your own voice and movement in it. Um, and for me, like that has been very beneficial to my own self-discovery and also just healing in moments of time, like moments I've experienced. Um, and yeah, as Kari said, Walker said, everyone highlighted it's um, empathy is bound to happen in these spaces. It's necessary because of the vulnerability and what you're sharing. Um, and that's something that I have not been able to find in other settings here at Hamlin or just throughout my life. Um, so it's, it's always been necessary, or at least I've found it to be necessary and I can't escape it and I won't escape it. Um, yeah, so that's my little thought. I'm gonna ask um, a question for Laura and Kari. You've both been involved as members of the Center for Justice and Law advisory board for the past several years. And it's been an explicit goal of mine. And I think of ours as members of that board um, to bring um, the theater and dance and the performance work happening at Hamlin sort of much more deeply engaged in the work of the Center for Justice and Law because of the connections that everybody's already sort of, I think, beautifully shared. So um, I'm wondering if um, the two of you would be willing to talk a little bit more about sort of why you sought out um, participation in the Center for Justice and Law as members of the advisory board, but how does, um, or what does um, bringing your work this semester and in general um, to the Center for Justice and Law, what does that, um, what does that mean for you, for our students, for our community? And then I know that was sort of its own big question, but as you're thinking about it, sort of uh, sharing a little bit more about um, the shows this, this semester. You want to go first, Laura? Yeah. Sure. Um, so the project that that I directed and that we that a few of the folks here have worked on was called the Homing Project, and it was a piece of devised theater, which is um, a, a mode of theater making. And Walker hinted. Walker mentioned this in one of his comments, where we don't come together around a script. You come together around it could be anything in this was the idea of home, notions of home and home going, home making, home coming. Um, and as a company, create the script together. So we do have a script. We do, they did memorize lines, um, but they created it all. As a facilitator and as a director of that work, I had different prompts for the participants, for the actors that we explored and, um, that through those answers and explorations, we develop the text and it's a, it's a form of theater making. I have um, wanted to line up our work with the Center for Justice and Law. Some of the things that happen that make that difficult is, you know, when, when a CJL will come up with a theme and then what the needs of the department are. And so if you're looking for a scripted show that lines up with a theme, and then all of the needs of a theater community, right? How big the show is and, and who is the cast and how does that meet the needs of, of our performing arts community? And um, even finding a show whose themes echo, augment, um, highlight the, the intellectual and the scholarly pursuits of the CJL in a certain year. I had wanted, I've worked with device theater in the past. I had wanted to be able to do some of that work with our students, though their students are doing that. We've had devised guests um, in our, as part of our department, but I haven't done devised work personally with the students here yet in my time at Hamlin. I knew, once I knew that the theme for the CJL was about immigration and refugee justice and health, 
and the law, what seemed so clear to me is that the ways, no matter your story of how you have come to either be in Minnesota in this moment and at Hamlin or live here, is that everybody has an immigration story. Um, and also migrating is about creating home and finding home. And in addition, for folks in university, it's such a time of home, of, of having left a home, of creating a new home, of navigating the space between those, between those places and which place feels more like home. So it just felt to me like a great opportunity to do that and something that we can all touch on so that meets the needs of everybody in the performing arts community. The other thing that Devise work does is it lets it be about the people who come to the table. So it's, um, you know, you're not looking for a cast of, in theater, it's always like three men and one woman um, and they're all white, but um, in the plays that exist in the world, as I'd be snarky about it, but that's mostly what it is. Um, but it's whoever comes to the table and the stories they wanna tell and share. And then the only other thing I wanna, uh, before I pass on to Kari is, is to highlight for both our art makers on campus, our performance students and the, and the community at large, how these, how these things connect, how everything we're doing in classrooms and through our centers of learning on campus is reflected and can be understood in new and different ways through the process of art making and watching art and creating art. And so how much we have to do with each other, how much research goes into creating art and then how much the art augments the scholarly pursuits. Um, I'll just talk briefly. So in terms of the way that I see the ensemble functioning on campus um, is, is an art making thing entity um, that even though I called the artistic director, I really see it as a collective of and I feel I'm almost I almost feel like I'm a producer of work. Um, and as well as a choreographer. And then I'm trying to honor a platform to develop student work. And so a lot of what the ensemble tries to do every year is we, I, you know, I, I'm trying to support students and their voices, right? So, so like in this season, the, the, the themes and the ideas, I don't place my like, you must do work around this idea. So that's why it becomes really difficult to connect up with like, we're trying to figure out um, how to get the ensemble to work within a specific overall theme. Because there's just, it's an eclectic patchwork of work, but I think it's authentic to the student voices. Um, so, um, and I and I feel like that's the role of the ensemble is, is, is a vehicle to allow students to produce work. And then I guide them through that. I, I go to rehearsals. I try to move and give different perspectives. And then I produce, which is like, I, I mean, Laura knows this, it's like akin to planning a really huge wedding every year <laughs> with all these different components. And so we try to produce all of that work. Um, as And then I also put my choreographer hat on and I try to produce work um, through that. And I know there was a piece that I had just, we had just finished last week, <laughs> right before the show, but um, Anthony and Annika are in this piece, but, and it was really, um, I was thinking about the notion of home um, in the back of my head. And I, I, I think similar to, I asked Annika about this, because um, I know you were stepping in both of these shows um, in terms of, you know, in terms of processing. And, and I had asked the students to do some writing about, you know, the Ukrainian war was happening. It also, I was also thinking about my own family's experience, the Japanese internment, American internment camps and how we had to, my family, many of my ancestors had, my relatives had to leave quickly. We had 48 hours to leave, right? two suitcases, only what you could carry. And I thought about situations in which, um, like, in, you know, when there's upheaval, what do you carry? What's of value to you? What do you, what do you choose? Do you choose the diapers or do you choose the, the photo album? What is of value to you? And so um, I had the students do a writing exercise and out of that we shared. And then from that, um, 
my role was to step back like what Laura does, right? I, you know, and devised was to squint my eyes, step back and go, where, where are the connective links? And so that is how we developed this one piece um, um, where I just wanted to get the stories and see what the connective pieces were. And then how is that then translated into movement metaphor, right? That visceral connection to those, to those images. And then, um, and then we kind of developed the work in that way. Um, and I think in terms of, of the, I don't know it necessarily if I'm gonna make a deep connection with the ensemble with the CGL, but I know that for me um, as an embodied artist and as a somatic practitioner and as someone who is really invested in transformative mediation and in different in community engagement, um, I hope that my role in stepping into like the Center for Justice and Law as an advisor is to be able to bring an embodied knowledge on there, just you know, and figure out how to how to use what we do in the arts, like in dance. And for me, my platform is dance and movement. How do we take what we just take for granted and we just do, and how do we translate that to the outer world in law, in other areas? Um, and so that's kind of been my mission. <laughs> Whether yeah, successful or I, not. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you um, sort of touched on that at the end because I think one of the things is that, you know, um, I was not expecting or hoping even that you would have um, a piece of your your um, return to movement that was sort of connected to sort of the content of the Center for Justice and Law. And I really agree with you and appreciate the idea that what um, what you do is inherently connected to justice, right? And and to the themes, whether or not it's sort of the content is the same. So I, I, I appreciate that you're sharing that for um, for our audience, th those connections. Um, I'm, this is a little bit off off the, the script, but in, is in response to sort of what, what both Laura and Kari are saying. And so I think for Anthony and Walker and Annika, what has it meant to be a part of a, creative performance space that is also, you know, part of your academic um, college experience that is, um, that is devised. I mean, I, I hope it's okay, Kari, to sort of think of return to movement. And I am thinking of the memories and um, rituals pieces from last night's performance uh, as examples of that. So you're giving the students prompts. So what is it meant to be able to work um, and contribute to something where you're responding to prompts and it's being all taken together. I mean, that is community too, but contributing to something like that, participating in something like that and performing something like that. Uh, I think I love devised work. I, that's something in college I've discovered that I just really, um, I, my background is mostly in um, theater and performance on that side. Um, so it has come to me that I just really enjoy that kind of work. I am also studying journalism. So I think there are all these weird intersections between, um, well, journalism and theater and performance period are all about telling stories. Um, and for me, having a space to explore my own story, but then explore stories that my cast and my fellow move movers like bring to the table. Um, and then Laura also created a space for, through the project um, that, where we could present other stories that um, we looked for like journalistically, that kind of way. So I think having a space that is devised is intrinsically related to everything that is academic, the goal of academia, academia of finding what it means to um, work collaboratively and work in a space of growth and learning and education. Um, because you are not only discovering something about yourself and about your story, but you're creating something that can be presented and shared with others. And I think that's a goal of both movement and performance is creating empathy through sharing other stories and presenting stories. I find that like specifically responding to prompts for let's say um, a certain piece kind of pushes like boundaries and like in my mind, like, I'll be like, I never thought of that, you know, like, I remember Kari, when we were first doing our memory piece, was like, if you had 10 minutes, what would you grab? If you had 10 minutes to, like, leave your home, what would you grab? And, like, 
I never thought about that, but I always thought about like how that like connected to my own like parents' stories and my grandma, you know, like I was just like, holy crap, like what did they do? And I always think about like how being in that type of space really helps push boundaries of like creativity, but also like the human experience, right? Asking like those really important questions that are often overlooked. And when I'm working like with my like wonderful on, um, teammates, like I find that it helps us create bonds that we've never like, how do I say, known about each other, you know, like, um, it's just really like almost like a beautiful mosaic of such like interconnected like themes and how do I say this um links between each other and I really like um happy to be a part of that space and very appreciative to be a part of that space because it's a really 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 cool space so yeah Yeah, and I mean, following up on like what both Annika and Anthony said, um, you know, you're given, uh, you're given prompts, and you ever no one's going to have the same answer unless like a heavy amount of cohesion, you know, has already been going on outside the outside of the space. But if everyone's going into this space not knowing, like, without a plan, without an idea of what's going to happen and instead is just coming in with their experiences their interests their academic their majors you know because that's certainly a part of you know like it's always um like anthony said it's a mosaic and it's and it's beautiful you uh you have one person who when asked what they're going to bring um with them they have was it 10 minutes to leave and you 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 grab you know what do you take for one thing you have people that have thought about that for their whole lives and people who have never thought about that you know in, and that is always such a in a space recognizing that can be its own piece of like and th so there's just so much that you know having it be organized with you know specific prompts you do create a space where everyone's voice everyone's experiences do matter because in answering those prompts one's experiences do come in and uh they're not uniform by the def by definition they they can't be and uh yeah it's divides uh, I, I I'm sorry. I just want to piggyback. It just reminds me. Um, so like the, what you guys were talking about, I, I know that there's one um, ensemble member where in, in memory and you guys know who it is, but, but there was a story and I'm, I'm assuming that they, I'm, I'm hoping that they are okay with me sharing, but it was the story in which as we were going through and we were talking about it, um, their response was, well, I wouldn't bring anything. I, I'm always taking care of my siblings. I'm always the one that gives, right? So I would never think about like bringing anything for myself, right? And that as a maker, was like, whoa, okay, that, I'm honing in on that. And that is, you know, at the end in which I felt like, how do we support this character, right? Well, we, we're gonna lift them, right? We're gonna support them. We're gonna, we're, you know, so to me, it was an interesting um, connection of like, here's this really profound story that felt in my gut, I need to I need to honor that. And maybe that is the connective link. So as a maker, I know, you know, Laura can speak to it from a theater, from a device theater perspective, but from a, from a movement perspective, it's, it's going, Oh, th there it is. That's the nugget that there it is. That's the story that actually can begin to be the link. Right. And so, and you never know what that is. You just have to be open to hearing it. Cause if you are constantly like, you know, no, this is what it's going to be. This is what's going to be. You're going to miss you're going to miss those moments of discovery. And so um, that was something that I, I felt like, you know, I, I, a lot of times in, in making, I will miss it. 
not gonna lie. Like, you know, but that was a really salient moment for me as a maker, not as a teacher, not anything, stepping away, putting my hat on as a, as a, as a, as a maker in that, in that, in that one moment, I was like, oh, I don't want to miss this story. How do I highlight this? Right. Um, and so um, I think it's really important just as you know, the, the collaborators are coming in to, to be vulnerable to their own stories. I feel as a choreographer, I have to allow myself to be vulnerable too, which is difficult. I mean, it's, you know, um, in a space where, in an academic space where we have teacher and student, or no, teacher and student, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like this, but, but, you know, you have a hierarchy and in the art form, that hierarchy has to go away. Otherwise you can't create authentic work. And so there's constantly a tension point that I think we in our department have to struggle with a lot and be mindful of. And so I think it also goes back to, to how we define community when we're making work within an educational institution. Now, when I'm making work with professional companies and things, we're, we don't have to contend with that because we're kind of coming in on a level playing field. And so I, you know, I just want to name that, that that is part of the process that I know as, as, as professors, we have to be really mindful of. Like, what hat am I wearing? And how do I ensure that those boundaries are there? And but but also how do I play with those boundaries a little bit so that we're 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 creating authentic work? And that is a constant, constant struggle. And yeah, I can't help but sense having attended both both the return to movement and the homing project of the semester, and also um, as a part of our larger Hamlin community and seeing the really incredible relationships between. Um, all of the people in this space that, um, that that vulnerability and sort of sometimes turning that hierarchy upside down or even just being vulnerable to it creates creates community, creates healing, creates connection that is, um, I think, probably part of why all of us um, are here, right? That, that, that is uh, important to all of us. Um, I'm going to pick up on a question I have, but also Anika kind of touched on it and Kari, you touched on it too. I think everybody's touched on it a little bit, but thinking about the power of stories and how powerful they are and when, you know, who tells a story, who owns it, who decides, right? You've all um, written prompts for the students. The students have responded to prompts. Anika, you've been in both, um, both performances this semester and sort of part of that. Um, you with the homing project, you've um, connected to stories that, that are your own, that are your fellow performers, that are sort of beyond beyond even um, uh, that. Way. I think that was something that was really striking about the homing project was the way in which you connected and engaged with stories beyond the the space. Um, so I, that's a big long preface, but to sort of ask if anybody wants to talk about. Um, how stories have been powerful for you, um, how sharing your own story has been potentially powerful. Walker, I'm I'm hoping you might talk a little bit about you. I know you've seen the question that I that I have uh, posed in our in our document, but I'm I was really struck by the line in the show where you say, home did not want my family, home didn't want my home. And I wonder if you want to talk a little bit more about that part of the piece, and then others can think about um. The power of storytelling and, and pick that up. Yeah, I mean, something that I uh, touched on in the um, in rehearsals and that I I'll, I'll try to bring up here. Um, it's it's something that's kind of hard to describe, right? So I'll just is that in my life I have had many moments where I have been most moments where I have been the person in power, whether it's explicit to me or not, because as a straight white man um, from a middle-class background, I have a certain amount of privilege that I, you know, did not recognize until it was made abundantly clear by, you know, many people in, in my life. And that's a lifelong problem. You know, you still never understand the difference because you can't live the difference you you can't um and so for much of my life i uh have kind of 
my my response for too long was to not go into the trauma uh not go into the fact that you know um my family did uh leave this country because of political persecution um and the fact that it's also you know happening right now and uh in many ways it's worse because it's so quick and so decisive right now with all these bills going on and all these states but um you know you what i said in rehearsal was in my life i worked so hard to be nothing more than a straight white man until i only became a straight white man and uh that's kind of something that theater has helped me deal with that this show really helped me deal with of like no one says someone's story doesn't matter and i think very often that seems to be the response from people in power who are asked to step aside and let people speak and i think more often than not if there was real not you know dialogue but that is um as equal as it can be that that's where understanding happens and that's where care happens that's where empathy happens at the same time how can a completely balanced um dialogue happen between some someone who has 99% of the world speaking for them and 1% of the world speaking for them you know when you have these structural um implicit explicit ideas of who is superior and who is not who is privileged and who is not it's very difficult to have these conversations and nor should people who are nor should people be forced to have them when when they're not because you you can't have if Elon Musk sits down to talk with you know a high school teacher i don't see how that discussion doesn't end up getting ruled by Elon Musk so when you have that amount of when you're aware of those um inequalities those implicit explicit um issues in your society the goal of the person in power should be to fight that always and love, can i yeah. jump in walker what i i want to give an example of what you're talking about in in what happened in homing project um it's almost like i want to i don't want to interrupt you i want to shine a light on something else that you did while you were talking about it is we talked about you know how do we talk how do we make a show about home right now knowing there is the war in ukraine and that people are away from their homes that the stories of um refugees and folks who have more immediate um uh temporality with their immigration stories how do we how do we we don't want to leave them out but the cast was really wonderfully reverent about not wanting to take on the stories as their own but not wanting to exclude them and talking about how we each did that so there were moments um walker shared a really personal story of his life and his family that became a real anchor of the show and then there were also moments that we included some poetry written by by professional folks um and then that how we tapped into Anika mentioned earlier moments of journalism of navigating homelessness um people struggling with home all over the world and one thing that Anika articulated in a rehearsal moment too was that it it had been happening and to make sure we clarified that the participant the performers read the stories of if if when we had Worse on Shire's poem home or um moments of journalism the performers read them with a piece of paper so it was clear to the audience or at least we were making the gesture for we are sharing this moment of somebody else's story and it is not mine as a way of navigating how do we include it without 
um, appropriating it, which I hear Walker talking about right now. What is it to yield space? What is it to be someone who it's not your story and how do you include it in your story without taking it over? And I saw in real time the, the theater makers, the performers in the homing project navigate that with grace and um, passion. So I wanted to highlight that as an example of what you were talking about, Walker. This hour has gone by very quickly and I, <laughs> I'm catching up with that, but I wanna um, maybe close us out with an observation and a question. Um, and as, as everybody here knows, I, I brought my 10 year old daughter to both performances and her delight and her joy in the work that you, yeah, thank you, Anthony, for insisting. Um, I, I think is something that has helped me sort of think about um, this question, but um, specifically in the homing project, um, when the cast reads Pablo Neruda's Ode to the Present, um, there is palpable joy amongst the actors, even though maybe it's not always like meant to be a, a joyous poem, but the, the, the performance brought the joy, right? The interaction between the actors. And then um, the, the piece that my daughter kept talking about last night from the memories performance um, was the way in which um, the dancer on the bench moved her fingers across. And that that was something that just was this little piece of joy in a very complex and not always joyous piece. Um, and so with the few minutes that we have remaining, um, I personally see that those moments of joy in the performances are part of the healing, part of the community um, creating experience. Um, so I'll ask um, our, our students if they wanna sort of talk about um, as we close out um, the way in which the joy that you find in this and the joy in those, those moments, um, what that's meant for you. For me, joy was found for, in both pieces in like the togetherness, the act of doing it together and in community. Um, and it was just so beautiful that I think the joy was so authentically felt that we were there together, spiritually connected, um, doing that, even though the performer that you mentioned, like it's a moment with them, but it's a moment that we all actively watch and take in because it is part of that shared piece. Yeah, I, I personally, when you all were reading that poem and just the, the give and the take, it just... I was smiling just watching it because I felt how much you all enjoyed it. It, it, it was really um, so clear. Walker, you're smiling. You want to add anything onto that? You, did you like doing it too? <laughs> I was smiling to um, uh, see the ground actually, but yeah, I mean, just like, uh, you know, a part of what made that sh that part so fun is that it was we treated it a bit like an improv game of we all jumped in when we could while still holding in mind that other people need to talk too, And so there's a rhythm created. There's like a and, and so that is also just a part of it of once you feel that it is going exactly how it should, which is no way yeah. because it's entirely in the moment. Um, yet you found that rhythm that's just, it's inexplicable. It's fantastic. Anthony, do you want to, you're such a joyous person always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, I find joy even so much, even in performing, but also like during our rehearsals, like there are moments, um, like for example, I was a part of uh, Lisa Berman's cast and also Kari's cast and there are like little moments where like, it's just like, oh, <laughs> that just happened. And it's just like really fun moments and like um, really like joyous moments. And when performing, it's like, oh my gosh, we're doing this all together right now. This is like, what? Like this took so many months of like an hours of rehearsal and like, it's finally happening. And it just feels like, almost like, um, how do I say this? Like, uh, I don't know. I can't find the proper words, but just overall joy. I just, it's something that is wonderful and magical. Well, I'm going to say that's a beautiful place to end the, the connections that you all create with each other and your other performers and, um, and your audience, um, I think really highlight uh, what we were trying to get at here today in this conversation. So I will express 
my gratitude to um, Anthony, Annika, Walker, Kari, and Laura. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. And um, I, I feel that, that this that always happens. We say, let's keep it short in an hour. And I think we probably could have um, talked much, much more, but thank you again for participating and um, join us at our next event, um, May 6th on uh, immigrant and refugee um, mental health. Uh, and again, thank you everybody.